The Word of God says in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 21, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, Why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our gods, our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks! And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I know that's a bit of a lengthy passage that was just read, but I, I want to acknowledge that it, it's good for us to read the word of God um, in these, these accounts in their entirety so as to uh, both understand context, but also the word of God is truth, it's power, and uh, that is able to change our life. Now, with that being said, you will notice I did skip the last two verses, or not skip, but I didn't read the last two verses of the chapter, and that is because we will eventually get there. But uh, I want to focus in on particularly um, the middle or the middle to the latter portion of the chapter, verses 10 through 21. We did read verses 1 through 9 as well to get context. Now, let me remind you just a little bit before we enter in with an illustration that we are looking at five aspects of this chapter. We noticed there was a claim of possession, a contrast of the presentations, a confrontation of the potentates, and then we started to enter into the concerns of the Pharaoh. And then there's going to be a fifth point, the constraints to our progress, which uh, we will discuss a little later on in this episode. But we're currently on the concerns of the Pharaoh, and we started talking about the things that he was concerned about. But we want to move on to a major subject of this chapter. Now, but before we do, let me uh, talk about one of my old um, favorite fictional tales. Um, and that would be both Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, Middle Earth, J.R.R. Tolkien's novels. And uh, if you're familiar with them, you'll remember the story of The Hobbit. And particularly in The Hobbit... There is this uh, one chapter which is called Out of the Frying Pan 
into the fire. And in this particular chapter, you might remember a few of the details where um, Bilbo is with his friends, which are like 13 dwarves and Gandalf. And uh, they're, of course, trying to escape some peril. And they're going through the, the tunnels of the Misty Mountains. And as they escape all this crazy tension and, and people trying, or not people, but um, characters trying to eliminate them, um, they finally escape and they come through this stone doorway and they're getting out of the Misty Mountains and, and as they finally wriggle free, well, what happens? A pack of wolves chases them and they, they chase them up into these trees and so then they're up in these trees and they're just like hanging out there um, and then the goblins come and the goblins come and surround them and, 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 and they're just like trapped again. In other words, they escape one peril, they go out of the frying pan and now they're into the fire again and so then the, the goblins are just kind of waiting to devour them and so they're waiting for so they they uh they start these fires and the fires of course are like climbing the trees and just waiting for these um hot this hobbit and the, the dwarves to come down and the goblins are singing their song burn burn tree and fern shrivel and, and scorch a fizzling torch to light the night for our delight well what's the point of all that the point is that sometimes we escape one thing and then Damn, we thought we were going to be in freedom. We thought we were going to be in peace. And then the very next thing is just worse, a seemingly worse situation than previously out of the frying pan into the fire. Well, this is really what we find here. You see, these, these children of Israel have been in bondage and slavery for 400 years. Things have been rough. We've seen all these episodes of uh, chapter 1 specifically, and then chapter 4 reiterating it through the signs that God gives. That what have they been through? They've been through slavery. They've been through this lie that was told that the babies were stillborn. They, they went through having their children thrown into the Nile, and God heard their cries. And now this deliverer comes, and what happens? After this deliverer comes and conveys the message to Pharaoh, the oppressor, well, all of a sudden, instead of them being free, things are going to get worse in this chapter again. And by the way, that's quite a parallel even to chapter 4. Remember when Moses is asking for signs, God's like, throw down your staff, and bam, it's a serpent. It's like, I'm a shepherd, and this is a serpent among my sheep. Things just got worse. I just want you to understand that when you walk with God, sometimes the situation will be out of the frying pan into the fire from our human eyes. But recognize that God is at work in those times when we feel like we're in the fire rather than in the frying pan that seemingly was burning us before. And so with that understanding in mind, let's dive into the text and let's discuss it. If I could entitle this particular episode anything, I would call it Lessons from a Mud Brick. <laughs> Lessons from a Mud Brick. I know it does not sound compelling. Uh, it does maybe not even interesting to you. I don't know. But it is accurate with this text. So Lessons from a Mud Brick. And I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess that you've never heard a sermon about a mud brick. Probably not. You may have heard a mud brick mentioned in a sermon, but you probably have never heard a message about a mud brick. And and, and I would be very hesitant to call these uh, podcast um, sermons because they're not really. They're Bible studies. We're diving into the Word of God. We're looking at, at a lot of uh, aspects of the text, and then it's really for you to go back and discuss it with your friends, with your community group, with your local church, whatever it might be, or maybe it's just you and the Lord. But I do encourage you, take what's being said here and understand uh, we're not trying to tie every loose end. We're not trying to give you something pretty. Uh, I, I want you to go back to the Word of God and dive deeper. And, and so that's what we're going to do here. Lessons from a mud brick. Uh, why do I call it that? Well, obviously, after Pharaoh sends Moses and Aaron out, he's very ticked off. And it says in verse 6, the same day. This is immediate. This is a reaction, not a response so much. A reaction. Pharaoh commands the taskmasters. And you're going to notice that even what he commands them is not going to be logical from uh, even a human perspective. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. And he commands them. Not only are they going to keep the same quota of bricks, which, by the way, bricks just are mentioned numerous times in this chapter. Um, in fact, the majority of references in Scripture are here in Exodus chapter 5. But with that being said, he then says, and we're not going to provide the straw either. So we're going to make your whole job of meeting this quota even more difficult than before. So this word for brick is used 11 times in Scripture. And again, uh, majority are right here in this chapter. And, and, and this is the, the building material, not only of Exodus chapter 5. It's actually the same building material which is mentioned back in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower at Babel. So what is it? Uh, this mud brick would be a, a clay and a straw sun-baked mixture. Um, and, and straw is integral. It was integral. It decomposes inside the brick, and that's really what brings strength to the bricks. Um, if you do it without the straw, they kind of lose shape. They'll sink in the sun, various things. But 
Obviously, bricks are inferior to stone, and we actually can see references to that. For instance, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10, um, and, and then later on, even altars were made out of um, such bricks in Isaiah 65, 3, and there were comments um, on that. But the point being is that this is an inferior building material, and we'll come to that as well. So I want to look at the bricks. I think there's some practical life lessons, lessons from mud bricks that we see in the text of this chapter. And so there's really... Um, there's four specific things that I want us to make note of here. First, we're going to notice there is an infatuation with the bricks. An infatuation. And an infatuation is an intense but short-lived passion or admiration for something or someone. So an infatuation with the bricks. You say, really? Yeah, we're going to see that. There's also an intention for the bricks. An intention for the bricks. Infatuation with the bricks. Intention for the bricks. Then there are ingredients which are in the bricks. And finally, there is an imprint on the bricks. Imprint on the bricks. So let's take a look at all these different aspects. Well, first we see an infatuation um, with the bricks, which Pharaoh clearly has here. Now, why do I say there's an infatuation with the bricks? Well, simply because uh, they're discussed many times as we walk through this chapter. We see in verse 6, he says, uh, hey, they got a key. his first thought is bricks. I mean, like this whole incident happens with Moses and Aaron, and immediately he's, he's like, the bricks, the bricks. Like, this is what his thoughts go to. And it's not just that, but he keeps mentioning them. He's like, same number of bricks. I'm not going to help you by getting the straw for it. And it's repeated over and over. And then we see there's no compromise that he's willing to make on these bricks. And so I want us to understand that when we're talking about his infatuation with the bricks, part of it is just how focused he is on this aspect. Um, if we talk about the, the bricks just in history itself, um, it, it's interesting because it, actually there's quite a few documents um, that discuss brick making even back in the days of the pharaohs. Um, there was an article which was written called Fortifications at Tel El Ritaba um, and is written by a couple Slovakian researchers. But um, they, they actually write that the production of mud bricks was recorded on the paintings in the tomb of Rechmir, which is 18th dynasty. Uh, men moisturized, dug out soil, kneaded it, and minced straw and transported it to a place where they molded it into rectangular forms into bricks, which were then placed in the sun to dry. And then it goes on to talk about how the straw degraded during the soaking and released somewhat this mucus. The mus mucus then impregnated the mud and blah, 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 blah. It goes through the whole detail. Why do I say that? Well, I, I say that because I want you to understand even on the, the walls of history, in the paintings, the creation of of mud bricks was something which was um, depicted saying this was an important element of Egyptian history of their building their empire was bricks um, and, and by the way that, that guy Rechmir which we were just talking about um, this is, his timing corresponds with an early date for the Exodus I'm not saying it was that date I'm just saying it corresponds to the early date so even the figures making the mud bricks on the walls of his tomb could have possibly been children of Israel, the Hebrews. Um, again, I don't know. Um, there's a, quite a bit more I could say on that. I don't think you want me to say more on that. So here's the thing. If you want more, if you want resources, if you want um, references that I'm using, let me know, and I can send you more about the mud brick making pro process. But understand this, that there was an infatuation with the bricks. If I can make a sub point off of that, here it is. It wasn't just an infatuation with the bricks, but it was a disregard for people. In other words, we're going to see Pharaoh is so focused on brick making that he doesn't really care about the people around him. And we see this. Why? It's going to lead to beating the people later on in the same chapter. It's going to lead to ignoring what they're saying. And this disregard of people really brings my mind to, I wonder if there are bricks in our life that we are so focused on that it's bringing a disregard for souls around us. In other words, we have an infatuation with that which is just mud, that which won't last, and yet it's getting in the way of us hearing the cries of others, of seeing the best for others, of seeing what God's got for us to do. Why? because we're so focused on a mud brick. But that's the first thing, an infatuation with the bricks that brought a disregard for people. The second thing is there is an intention, 
an intention um, for the bricks. Now, what is this intention for the bricks? Well, what were bricks for? <laughs> What's their intention? Obviously, buildings. But hang on. If you go to Egypt today, and I lived there for many years, if you go to Egypt today and you visit the monuments of the past, you'll visit temples and you'll visit tombs, but you will not visit the palaces or the regular buildings of Pharaoh's day. Now, why is that? Why do you visit temples and tombs, but not the palace? And that's because uh, there was a distinct difference in the building material. You see, when, when palaces were built, they used mud bricks. When regular buildings of the time were built, mud bricks. But temples and tombs were viewed as that which is eternal, prepared for eternity. And therefore, they used stone in the making of it. And that's why we still have it today. But the intention for bricks is that which is temporary. In other words, they knew that that which was being built with bricks was not going to last. So if the first thing I said was an infatuation with the bricks and that points to a disregard for people, well, the intention for the bricks points to a disregard for permanency, a disregard for permanency, which is eternity. Uh, I just wonder, those mud bricks of our life, are we building that which doesn't last? Are we intentionally pouring our money, our efforts, our time into that which won't bear any fruit any throughout eternity? Uh, Jesus talks about fruit that remains, fruit that remains in John 15. And that's what I pray for. That's what I pray for from my life, that my life would bear fruit that remains. Well, here we see the intention for the bricks was that which will not remain. And so again, what a vivid reminder for us. It took millions of bricks, millions of bricks to satisfy the architectural ambitions of Pharaoh. And yet today, those bricks no longer exist. Those bricks have been broken down and those bricks uh, or the absence of those bricks is a reminder of the futility of living for that which is not eternal. Let me just remind you two things last for eternity. Souls and the word of God. Invest your life into those two things and you will have a life that matters. Uh, or I should say a life that counts. Because your life does matter regardless. The question is, are you living for that which will last? Uh, moving on, though, it's not just the infatuation with the bricks that points to a disregard for people and intention for the bricks that points to a disregard for permanency, but there are the ingredients in the bricks, ingredients in the bricks. Uh, and this is going to point to a disregard for pragmatism, a disregard for pragmatism. And what is pragmatism? It's dealing with uh, things sensibly and realistically in a way that's um, based on the practical rather than just theoretical. Um, and that's what Pharaoh's not doing. Pharaoh's not being pragmatic. Pharaoh's not being practical. He, he, his ingredients in the bricks, he's literally ignoring um, thought. He's ignoring uh, what's actually even best for him. And this happens a lot when we lose sight of eternal things and when we lose sight of eternal souls. Uh, why do I say that? Well, let's look back to the text here. What does he do? First thing he does that same day, verse 6, he, he calls the taskmasters, their foremen, and he says, you're no longer going to give people straw in verse 7 to make bricks. Now, this is vital. Why? Because straw is really an essential ingredient for strong bricks. So now we have one of two options. We either have bricks with no straw or else they're going to have to find their own straw, which is going to mean probably fewer bricks. Now, he says the daily quota isn't going to, can't change, but the reality is it would change. And we're going to see that in just a little bit. So what we see is when a person rejects God's way, God's message, even the mind that he's given them to process, uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And we see that all over. We see that in universities around the world where the fool says there is no God, where the fool tries to explain science without God, tries to explain creation or, or no creation without God. It's foolish. It makes no sense. I mean, not one, not one scientist would ever suggest that a watch magically had all of its pieces come together and start ticking. And yet they'll suggest there was no designer behind this world that has patterns, that has design. Oh, the fool. But that's what happens. Uh, 
That's what happens when we start to have a disregard for even pragmatism, even using the brain. Why? Because we want a world where we're in control. We want a world where we don't have to give account to God, and that's what Pharaoh's trying to do here. And, and so what does he start to do with this whole um, daily quota thing. Well, you understand, uh, slaves in that day were required to meet a daily quota of mud bricks. In fact, there's two New Kingdom Egyptian sources, a leather scroll from the fifth year of Ramses the second's reign, um, and also papyrus from Anastasi III in the, in the third year of Merentoff's reign from both in the 13th century, and it refers to brick making. What's interesting here is that that leather scroll, which is in the Louvre, um, it, it actually specifically deals with the quota of bricks, and it says on that scroll that 2,000 bricks were the quota for whether that's a few men. I'm not sure how many were in that group, but 2,000 bricks were the quota um, in that particular scroll, and so whatever that group represented. The point being is that what we see in Scripture is also recorded in all these historical documents, very well documented, by the way. Um, and here in Exodus 5, 8, we see a number of bricks. We see in 5.18, the same number of bricks. For chapter 5, verse 19, your daily number of bricks. This quota, this number of bricks is very important to the text. Why? Because it's repeated three times. And uh, Egyptian officials, they discovered that the way to get slaves to make enough bricks was to establish these quotas. It, it pushed them towards a certain production. Um, in, in fact, there's in one ancient text, the official is talking about how they're making their quota of bricks daily. But you know what? That, that couldn't be said for the, the children of Israel here. What do we see in verse 14? Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? In other words, you're falling off. Well, there's a reason that they were falling off. Why were they falling off? Well, this is where they understood something that we don't understand when we come to read the Word of God. Um, straw was vital in the process of making bricks. In fact, without straw, the bricks were fragile and they would break easily. But collecting straw for the bricks was actually extremely hard work. The straw normally, after the wheat had grown, the straw would be taken from the fields um, after it was harvested and crushed by the farmers. And in ancient times, it says that Egyptians would leave the stems in the fields, They would um, the stems of the wheat, that is, and that would minimize the labor which is needed for mud brick production. Um, so, but the straw would have only been available after harvest time. You understand that? The straw would have only been available after harvest time, which means even though construction goes year-round, um, bricks really could only be produced during a certain season of the year, which means... That if this isn't the season and Pharaoh's storehouses aren't accessible where all of this grain, the stems of grain, had been stockpiled, you're literally asking the Hebrews to do something which is practically impossible. How can you make your quota of bricks without a key ingredient? Now, uh, we've, we've noticed that in our world recently with supply chain issues. If the supply chain isn't there, then other things start falling off. This is the situation. The supply chain's not there. And yet, he's saying if you don't, not only are you going to be beaten, but the consequences are going to get more dire and more severe. And, and so I, I find this to, to really be telling, it very speaking, because in his disregard for pragmatism, we really have the same thing in our lives when it comes to our souls when we disregard the Word of God. We start to disregard His Word because we don't want to surrender. We don't want to give in. But what, is, what does it lead to? It leads to ill effects on our own life. When we choose to live in the ways of the world, sometimes our, we lose our children children to the world, to the wicked things around us. Maybe we, we lose our health because of the lifestyles we choose to adopt because we want to embrace the sin around us. Maybe we lose our very life because of that. And ultimately, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not a believer in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, conquered the grave, that he's coming again, well, you're going to lose your own soul in your rejection of him. See, here's Pharaoh thinking he's holding this power and that by imposing his power, somehow he's promoting his kingdom. But the reality is the opposite. His, the, the very thing he wants to build is going to come crumbling down because of his refusal to listen. Listen to God ultimately, but then even here, 
through the mouths of the foremen um, that are discussing it with him. And so I want us to see, again, um, just this key aspect of the ingredients in the bricks. But the final thing I want to mention is the imprint on the bricks. Imprint on the bricks. And uh, if the infatuation with the bricks was a disregard for people, the intention for the bricks was a disregard for permanency, ingredients in the bricks was a disregard for pragmatism, the imprint on the bricks is his desire for preeminence, his desire for preeminence. Now, let's talk about this desire for preeminence. You see, Egyptian bricks, and this is fascinating, were typically or frequently stamped with the name of the king during whose reign they were made. So, in other words, think about this. These very bricks would have had, I mean, maybe maybe not consistently all the way through Egyptian history, but very possibly would have had that pharaoh's name stamped on it. Now, it's interesting. I keep saying that pharaoh's name because we don't know which pharaoh it is, and that's beautiful. Why? Because it's irrelevant. And why is it irrelevant? It's irrelevant because his name's faded from history. We don't know. We can hypothesize which pharaoh was it. We don't know. And that's the thing. The relevance of our life is based on our submission to the word of God and who the Lord is. But there is quite a bit of um, history on the imprint on these bricks and it being imprints of the king at the time. And, uh, and not that it's necessarily that important, but, um, but Egyptian bricks were very distinct, different sizes than Babylonian bricks. And, uh, and again, just like even some of the distinct features, including these names stamped on them. But I, I want us just to keep all that in mind when we think about lessons from bricks, because the reality is all of these things can be true in our life. What are we building? With what are we building? Do we have a disregard for people in our pursuit of this objective? Do we have a disregard for our local church? Do we have a disregard for, um, for, for what actually matters in the light of eternity? Do we have a disregard for that permanency? Um, are we actually ignoring even the pragmatic because of how focused we are on our dream, our goal, our objectives? And then ultimately, are we trying to imprint our name on these bricks? Is it our name we're trying to be have remembered? When in reality, imprinting your name on bricks you know a mud brick is going to break down is that where you're trying to put your name mud bricks or rather are you uh being hidden in christ where it says in colossians 3 3 for you died and your life is hidden with christ in god in verse 4 when christ who is your life appears you will appear with him in glory oh what lessons from bricks we can learn now that's not the end of the message though um that we have for today from this chapter because we really want to end with the constraints to our progress and i hope you're noticing these constraints are already starting to come out but as we look at this chapter, constraints to our progress, I'm talking about spiritual progress here, there's uh, just a few things I want to mention in closing. First, uh, one constraint to our progress is disappointment. What do I mean by disappointment? Well, there's a lot of disappointment in this chapter. Uh, did you notice how how we, we, we closed out here? When I say we closed out, because the chapter doesn't close out here, but we stopped in verse 21, and they're talking to, to, uh, to Moses and Aaron, and these uh, foremen say, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And then you've made a stink. <laughs> wow. Well, there's disappointment. There's disappointment in how God is working. It makes me think um, uh, over to Luke 24. Remember when the two, two individuals on the road to Emmaus where they said we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. It makes me think of Mary in John 11 when uh, Jesus comes to Bethany after Lazarus has died. And she says in verse 32 of John 11, Lord, if you had been here. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. There is a disappointment, and that could be a constraint to our progress, this disappointment where we had hoped God would do something differently than he had. Now, I'm going to come back to all this. I'm just sharing. With These are constraints. These are things that sometimes hold back our progress when we live in disappointment and we just feel God has failed us. He has made us stink. He has made life worse than before, all because we chose to obey. Um, it makes me kind of think back to Princess Bride, and there's a quote in there where Nigo Montoya says, uh, uh, who are you? And Wesley says, no one of consequence. And Nigo Montoya says, I, I must know. <laughs> and then Wesley says, well, get used to disappointment. Sometimes we feel that way in, in our life in Christ, like get used to disappointment. Well, I'm not so sure that's the perspective we should have. See, when we live in disappointment, what we're actually doing is ignoring the full story. We're focused on one episode rather than seeing what is God actually up to. And again, doesn't mean we understand every detail, 
but we can look at the Lord and see he who never changes. Uh, and, and so we see disappointment. Another constraint would be distress, um, feeling overwhelmed by your circumstances. Now, I want you to see how they responded. See, they felt overwhelmed by their circumstances. So what did they do? Well, this is sick. They didn't cry out to God. They went back to their slave master. They went back to Pharaoh. They appealed to the very one who was oppressing them, seeking alleviation from the source that was the source of their pain in the first place. And we do the same thing. How often in this world do we feel overwhelmed by elements of this world? So what do we do? We look for more of the world to ease the elements of the world. In other words, it's just this vicious cycle of where we're putting our dependency in things of the world. We try to overcome one addiction by becoming addicted to the next thing. And this is what we see happening here. There is a distress, but rather than allowing the distress to push them and point them to the God, what do they do? They allow their distress to be a constraint. And ultimately, in this vicious cycle, going back to Pharaoh, begging Pharaoh and putting more dependency in who Pharaoh is. Uh, who do we turn to? Who do we turn to in moments of great distress? We don't just see disappointment and distress. We also see a domination happening. When I say domination, this, this feeling controlled by your circumstances. Um, in verse 19, it's interesting. It says, The foremen of the people of Israel saw they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce the number of bricks or your daily task each day. <laughs> you don't say, right? Um, they definitely are in trouble. But the, that, that, that phrase, in trouble, the word is raw. Uh, And and this is possibly even a wordplay on the name of the Egyptian god, um, sun god, which is Ra or Re. And uh, that's fascinating because Pharaoh was seen to be the incarnation of this god, of the same god. So this wordplay um, going on here, I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but it does happen again in in Exodus 10, chapter 32, Numbers 11, um, Numbers 20, Deuteronomy 9. This word's mentioned multiple times. And regardless of of whether or not that's the wordplay being intended, I, I do think that they saw their trouble as um, ultimately coming from Pharaoh's hand and being controlled by Pharaoh. I don't know what your trouble is today, but do you see the power in the world's hands? Or when you look at your trouble today, do you see it as an opportunity for your God to be glorified, recognizing he has the last word? Your trouble doesn't have the last word. You might call it Ra or Re. You might call it whatever title you put on your trouble, but the reality is the circumstances in which you find yourself today are actually perfectly suited for you to fully glorify God. I'll say it one more time because I think you need to hear it one more time. The circumstances in which you find yourself today are perfectly suited for you to fully glorify God. I had to remind myself of that many times as I walked through cancer, that these are perfect circumstances. And the question is not why. The question is, Lord, what do you want to do in the midst of this? And so we see that there is a a distress and there is domination. But there's a couple more things. There's disillusionment. Uh, Disillusionment in in who God is. It's a feeling of disappointment. Uh, They're disappointed from this discovery saying, man, God, you're not exactly doing what we thought you would do. Now, for this, I I really do want to draw your attention to the verses I didn't read because we're going to come back to them later. But um, notice what, what, what Moses says when he calls out to God in verse 22. He says, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to your people? Why did you ever send me? And then in verse 23, uh, Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. <laughs> He's disillusioned. He's saying, God, you're not who I thought you were. Now, nothing wrong with that, that he's not who Moses thought he should be. But we can become disillusioned. The question is, did God fail what he said? No, actually, God said already back in chapter 3 that Moses, that Pharaoh was not going to listen to him. God's just doing exactly what he said he would do. Do we actually grow disillusioned when God does exactly what he says he'll do? I mean, Jesus Christ says, Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil falsely against you on my account. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Paul promises his son of the faith, Timothy, that anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Do we grow disillusioned when God does exactly what God says he will do? There's one more thing here. There's also discouragement. There's discouragement in our role. See, sometimes our role seems to just be like, God, why did you put me in this position? 
you're making me look bad. Moses is going to look terrible here. What does it say in verse 21? You have made us stink. You don't just stink. You made us stink. It's one thing to stink. It's another thing to make other people stink. And that's what Moses and Aaron are doing. They're discouraged in their role. So I want you to see there's disappointment. There's distress. There's domination. There's disillusionment. Uh, there's discouragement. But the reality is God's doing something bigger. Uh, just recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was um, at the tell, um, the dig, archaeological dig in Shiloh, where, of course, the tabernacle resided for 369 years. And while we were there, the lead archaeologist gave us permission to pick up um, some various uh, pieces of clay, broken clay pots and just um, clay pieces from the day. And uh, as I picked up these clay pieces and had them, a, a comment was made by one of the archaeologists there that whenever something was used for a holy purpose, whether it was a bowl or a cup, after using it for that holy purpose, they would break it. And the reason they would break it is because once that pot or plate uh, cup was broken, it couldn't be used for something else. In other words, it was used for a holy purpose, and that was broken so that it wouldn't be good for anything else. It was reserved for that one purpose. And I thought, hang on a second, there's a deep lesson here. And the lesson is this, that... Those whom God desires to use for holy purposes, he breaks. And why does he break us? Well, there's many reasons I would say, but based on that illustration, I was really touched that he breaks us in such a way where we are reserved for his purpose. We might be broken in such a way where we no longer are able to do the things we were able to do before. We might be counted out of things that we previously participated in, but God doesn't break us. Because he's mad at us, he breaks us so that we are consecrated, so we are reserved, so we are set apart wholly for him. Broken pottery. Isn't that exactly what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4? That we have this treasure in earthen vessels? Remember those earthen vessels back in Gideon's day when the light was put in them and they surrounded the Midianites? When did they have victory? Well, when the trumpet sounded, when the pots were broken and the light shone, but the light didn't shine forth until the pot was broken. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But when does the world see the light of Christ? Well, they see it when our clay is broken and the light shines through. See, it's in our brokenness they say, wow, you have hope in something beyond what the world says is the source of hope. And here what we see is, yeah, there's a lot of stinking going on. There's a lot of confusion. There's disillusionment. There's discouragement. There's domination. There's distress. But God's going for something bigger. The other day, I uh, all night, I, I had this phrase just keep coming to my mind in my dream. And then when I would wake up and back in my dreams and I woke up with it just in my mind. I couldn't even remember the song at the time, but it's the phrase, you deserve the greater glory. You deserve the greater glory. You deserve the greater glory. Now I looked up the song. And the song says, I approach the throne of glory, nothing in my hands I bring, but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious king. I will give to you my burden as you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the king in need of nothing. Empty handed, I rejoice. See, God doesn't use a magic wand and just bam, job is done. No, no, hang on. He is going to use actually a staff throughout this book, a staff of Aaron and of Moses. But the point is God works through people, evil sometimes, but broken people, broken people. Now, obviously we're all sinners, but you understand what I'm saying when I say evil sometimes. Like obviously we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all evil, but praise God for salvation and not just salvation in Jesus Christ, but he makes us new. Um, at the end of the day, though, at the end of the day, we need to remember um, Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, weeping may tarry or last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, I know that verse encourages many, but friends, even with joy in the morning, we need to remember that night comes again. <laughs> See, we can have joy in the morning, but then night comes again. And I'm not being pessimistic. I'm just recognizing in this broken and hurting world, we, we, we oftentimes see a cycle of disappointment, distress, domination, disillusionment, discouragement. These things in, in the world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Now, you might be saying, but joy in the morning refers to heaven. 
Well, you see, that's the good news. In this world, we do have night, and we do have morning, and then night comes again. But friends, Revelation 22, 21, verses 22 through 25 says this, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. Get this. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Friends, there's coming a day when that cycle ends. It's not night, morning, night, morning, night, morning. It's night, morning, night, morning, night, morning. Stop. Forever. It's day. Friends, there is coming an end to all this distress and disillusionment and domination, discouragement that we're facing. But the reality is we live in time, and we need to ask ourselves a question from a bunch of mud bricks. What are we building? Where are we investing? And are we allowing our hope and our faith to be in a man named Pharaoh? Or are we trusting a God who takes mud from the ground and breathes life into mankind and says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And I have a purpose for you. And I'm going to show you just how deep my love is through sending my son, Jesus Christ. So you might know your true identity, that in him, you're mine forever. And this God deserves the greater glory. And I pray that from your life and from mine, he will indeed get it. We're out of time. Um, Please check out our our YouTube channel for more resources or www.intoyourbible.org for much more content, study notes, um, and uh, free resources to download. But remember, this has been Into Your Bible, and Into Your Bible is a place where we pray that you will be one who loves the Word of God and the God of the Word.